welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the session on uh, mobility for sustainable tourism. Uh, my name is Sylvia Borkowska. I'm a strategy and policy coordinator in uh, DG Move, Directorate General for Mobility and Transport uh, in the European Commission. It is my pleasure to moderate today's session. Um, I will provide a short introduction to what we will be discussing today, then we'll introduce our lovely panelists, and then I will ask you to also participate actively in Slido. Um, um, mobility is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, sources of uh, emissions um, out of uh, tourism. And uh, at the same time, tourism is one of the fastest growing economies with uh, a big influence on our economy, our uh, social life, employment. Uh, so it's hard to stop it. Um, over 50% of Europeans took uh, at least one trip uh, in the last year um, with at least one overnight stay. This is more than 200 uh, million people in Europe. At the same time, 82% of Europeans declare uh, in 2021, in the uh, Europe barometer, they declare that they are ready to change their habits uh, and move to sustainable mobility. So today we will be discussing um, how to change, how to actually make this change, how to encourage more tourists uh, to urban destinations, because we are talking uh, about urban mobility in this event, uh, to switch to more sustainable mobility modes uh, when going to urban destinations. Um, we will talk about what are those different sustainable mobility options for tourists and what are the challenges and possible policies that could support this goal. And tonight we have, uh, today, sorry, <laughs> good, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today we have fantastic panelists who will uh, participate in the discussion uh, together with you. Uh, we have Gr uh, Chris Greenwood, who is a, s a senior research fellow at the Moffat Center for Travel and Tourism Business Development. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. We have Bente Grimm, uh, who is a sociologist and pro head of tourist mobility research at the Institute for Tourism Research in Northern Europe. We have Nina Nesterova, Professor for Sustainable Development in Tourism and Transport at Breda University of Applied Sciences. And we have Patrick Torrent Kerald, Executive Director of uh, the Catalonia Tourism Board and Vice President of Nextur, which is the abbreviation for Network of European Regions for Sustainable and Competitive Tourism. Welcome, our dear panelists. But I would like to start the discussion also involving all of you. That's why I would like to screen uh, how to connect to Slido. I would like you to pick up your mobile phones and tell us where did you uh, come from today. You can either scan the QR code or quickly type into your mobile slido.com or even slido.do. There are many possibilities to connect. Which country did you travel from to the Urban Mobility Days? As we can see, it can also be a town. <laughs> uh, but um, in principle, we would like to see the countries. OK, we have quite a, quite a diversity. <laughs> also us um, came from different countries. I'm based in Brussels, but I'm Polish. Uh, Chris uh, came from Scotland, uh, Ninak from, from the Netherlands, Bente from Germany, and Patrick from higher up in Spain, from yeah. Barcelona. And here we can see that uh, in, in this room there is most people from Spain, but also in Italy, Netherlands, and many, many other countries. Now the question is, how did you arrive to Sevilla? So please, if we can switch to the next question. If you arrived in the Sevilla airport, which means of transport did you use to come to the city? <laughs> All right, perfect. <laughs> then you have the possibility of uh, one of the bottom options is not applicable. <laughs> That's why we, we ask uh, if, if this is the case. 
Does it mean that you arrived by train? Yeah. Fantastic, me too. <laughs> Very good. Um, who else, maybe by raising hand, arrived by train? Okay, so this, is, this, this also contributes to our discussion. But otherwise, among those who arrived to the Seville airport, uh, most of us came by taxi and some of us uh, one-fifth by public transport. All right, still there are some, <coughs> some cases of other means of transport, like car carpooling, shuttle bus, or private rented electric car. Uh, fantastic. Um, now, as we know, that there are many ways how we can uh, arrive to this event and also to other urban tourist destinations. I will have um, two questions to two of our panelists to start over the discussion. My first question is, um, um, because many, many of the de decisions of what will be our mobility at an urban tourist destination also, uh, happen already before the arrival, right? We have to choose how we will actually arrive to the, our destination, but also we, ha we can imagine how we will move around. We sometimes book a car in, uh, beforehand, or we realize what are the sustainable mobility options. So, uh, Nina, could you please tell us what are the patterns um, that researchers observed in terms of the mobility choices mm -hmm. of tourists coming from different countries to European urban destinations? Yes, thank you, Sylvia. I think it's a very nice opening question because, uh, indeed, speaking about urban mobility, uh, decisions on a mobility behavior at destination, very often we take it as the origin already, or the origin of the trip. So, for example, uh, research definitely shows that uh, main transport mode that we choose to arrive to the destination, it's really a key determinant to the uh, subsequent transport mode choice at destination. That means if you arrive by public transport you are, or by rail, you're much more inclined to use a public transport. If you arrive directly by car or by airplane to destination, then consequently in the trip you're also much more uh, inclined to use a rented car or taxi or any other mode. And uh, so I think that's one of the components. Another component is also um, in our uh, uh, tourism mobility behavior, very, very much influenced by our own uh, commute uh, habits, mobility commute habits in our own countries. So, for example, if you think about uh, European tourism, people are really used to, much more used to travel by public transport and by cycling. But if you look at Americans or Chinese tourists also, for example, who are second and third category of visitors in Europe in general, uh, use of public transport in USA is 2.5%. Majority is really done by car, so we really cannot expect tourists to directly switch to sustainable urban <laughs> mobility options while they cross a border of a city. It's a little bit better, for example, with Chinese tourists, 20% are using public transport, so that's why also we see they are much more inclined to use shared bus coaches to travel throughout Europe and share mobility options. But I think in this sense, it's very important to know who is coming to Euro, how, Europe, how they are coming to Europe, what are their plans <coughs> to visit inside of Europe, intensity of visitor attractions they have in mind. And uh, yeah, really depending on it, uh, start looking in urban mobility, uh, sustainable urban mobility for these tourists. Mm -hmm. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Nina. And Bente, then what can be done to encourage tourists while they are making the travel plans to go for more sustainable mobility options? Yeah, in my opinion, it's um, most important to reach the tourists before they plan or while they plan their trip and before they depart. Mm -hmm. Because as Nina said, it's, uh, the most important influencing factor is the mode of arrival. And this means that if you manage to inspire the tourist, to give, him the, to give him or her the information about the mobility offer at your city, it might, it might make an influence on their decision. And um, what we found out uh, in our market research uh, uh, surveys, we are doing the German Reise Analyse, which is one of the um, biggest uh, surveys on tourist mobility behavior uh, of the German-speaking population in Germany, and we found out that people, or the tourists, 
they don't look for mobility information at the public transport associations, but they want to get the information at the accommodation or at the tourist information. So this is their point of contact. And the best way of influencing them in a more sustainable way is to inform them actively before they come. And so that, and even if they have booked the journey, uh, you could give their, them an information, like my hotel did here in, in Sevilla. They gave me the information uh, by which bus line or metro line I could reach uh, this hotel. As I told me, they could have given more information. They could have told me, okay, how often does the bus line go and what's the name of the bus stop or of the train station. And another point is um, to, to tell the people about the advantages of using public transport outside at the city. Because in, in bigger cities like Berlin or Paris or Barcelona, uh, people expect that there is a very good uh, uh, public transport uh, option at the site. But in smaller cities, they don't know and they are afraid of maybe not uh, having the best mobility options. But if you tell them, okay, you have advantages, there's an added value. Um, or maybe you could even um, give them incentives. So there are um, accommodations or uh, tourist regions who uh, give out uh, guest cards with included mobility options so that you don't have to think about ticketing, about tariffs, uh, all these things which you don't know as a tourist. And this might influence uh, their decision. Perfect, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, would Patrick or Chris uh, want to contribute anything to the discussion on the uh, choices that are made before arrival? Uh, yeah, um, I think we also need to take into account the profile of the visitor, not just the nationality. Uh, younger and older uh, visitors will be accessing information in different ways, may not be going to traditional sources of information, particularly younger uh, travelers, which are of course a key demographic that many destinations want to attract. They may be looking through uh, social media. So I think the traditional channels of providing information on options should look at a wider range of uh, communication and focus those and profile those to the visitors that they want to target. I mean, uh, so digital um, unconnectivity with older generations who may not have smartphones where they can access inf this information, do they still require uh, information that's printed uh, or um, information that's provided through uh, uh, you know, kiosks or uh, information desks uh, to, to provide that type of, of information to dispel some of the problems and uh, possible uh, confusions over travel? All right, thank you. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Let me just uh, emphasize the, the role of marketing in the mobility and in the mobility before the arrival to the destination. I think it's important to include mobility as a part of the experience in destinations. Uh, often we used to have the idea of the, the, the final, the end of the, of, the of the trip, of the mobility. Uh, we're going to go in Barcelona to the Sagrada Familia, for example, but it's important in our case, our priority is to well, to boost the mobility on foot in the city of Barcelona is not so complicated. We are uh, working in order to have uh, pedestrian uh, blocks that could help us to have a good experience uh, in, on foot mobility. And we think that it's good for marketing to emphasize and to prioritize the focus and the message and the storytelling in the mobility as a part of the experience. Mm -hmm. To walk on the streets of Barcelona, to live the uh, atmosphere, the shops, the bars, the cafes, the, the, I think is, is part of the, of the, of the visit, is part of the interaction with locals, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the public transportation, obviously, but in the street as well, is the way to uh, live better and to uh, breathe the rhythm of the city. Mm -hmm. And we think uh, we need not focus our marketing mm -hmm. in the final destination. We need to focus our marketing in the, in the holistic experience in the city and is part of our job, as a, in the, our case, a, as a DMO, as a destination marketing organization, to create a storytelling, not only focusing in the last part of the trip, but in the whole journey. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I take from here that the mobility should become part of the whole narrative on uh, how our tourism experience should be, 
and uh, the information is key, and also targeting, like the format of this information should uh, be adjusted to the target group. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, topic. So actually, what are the different forms of uh, sustainable mobility uh, for tourists in uh, urban destinations? If we can go to the next slide of questions. For those of you who uh, have come a little bit later, uh, you can use the QR code or use the uh, slido.com website to quickly log in and uh, answer the current question, which is, which types of mobility do you normally use as an inhabitant uh, in your city or town, in your normal everyday life? And you can choose more than one option. So tell us everything that you are normally of course, <laughs> we are walking around our cities. We are using public transport. Um, OK, quite many people are using private uh, bike or e-bike. But uh, I would wait for more answers, because currently we have only five responses. Which types of mobility uh, are you using in your everyday life? I, I try to use the bike as often as possible, mm -hmm. and if not, um, I take the train. If I, I live at a smaller place, and I take the train to the city. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's not possible, I take the car. So I use. I, I'm a very multimodal <laughs> person. I, I use, and yeah. of course, I'm, I'm walking, of walking course. as well. So many, many modes of transport for me. Indeed, uh, indeed, this corresponds with the answers that we have here. And of course, uh, as inhabitants, we are often combining different modes. But uh, here we have walking, public transport, private, private uh, e-bike or bike, or private uh, petrol diesel car, 30%. OK, if we can move on to the next uh, question. Which types of mobility did you use during your last holidays or during your last visit at an urban destination? Somewhere else that you that you leave. It could be during summer holidays or just during your last visit. So it was mostly public transport and walking. So basically very similar pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and taxis. Peop uh, people use more taxis uh, than during their everyday life. And then also. For the time being, I see a little bit less of uh, private uh, or rented <coughs> diesel, car, petrol or diesel car. OK, so um, perhaps <laughs> we are in a very particular uh, group today, gathered mm -hmm. of people interested in sustainable mobility. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that uh, this is representative for the whole population, <laughs> but it's a very positive <laughs> result. <laughs> Um, thank you for your answers. And now uh, we move to the panel discussion, uh, because, of course, there are many options uh, for, of sustainable mobility in urban areas. However, uh, they tend to be designed and offer mostly for the citizens, uh, for the everyday users, and the public transport system, the shared bike system. Uh, they, they tend to be designed and placed following the usual commute. Um, so the question to Chris, <laughs> which sustainable mobility options are the most prominently used by tourists in Scottish urban destinations? And who and how encourages tourists to, to use them? OK, so um, among the, the, the location that got city designation, um, all of the cities uh, have uh, extensive uh, walking culture. Indeed, uh, walking, city-based walking is, is the singular most popular activity for visitors to Scotland, both domestic and international. If we look at the cities, the four cities that have got uh, international airports, uh, all those uh, cities, the four of them, um, they have um, connectivity from the airport to the city centre uh, using public transport. Uh, principally by uh, bus service, uh, but Edinburgh uh, does have a tram network. That tram network has now been extended, and I'll come to, to the consequence of that in a, a second. Um, 
As I mentioned, um, all the cities uh, have a very strong walking culture. Um, there's been a lot of urban regeneration in uh, cities like Glasgow and Aberdeen, where um, post-industrial areas, uh, particularly along uh, canals, uh, have been regenerated so that these are now uh, urban uh, throughways for cycling and walking. And these are actually creating new products for visitors to the cities uh, so that um, they can go and explore uh, other areas. And this is creating uh, small kind of um, cultural hubs uh, around the city. Um, going to sort of like mass transportation, uh, I mentioned uh, Edinburgh has a tram network that's now been extended, which again allows the ease of movement because of the simplicity of ticketing and uh, the, the, the network, you can now move people from airport to city centre, from city centre down to the waterfront area in Leith, which again is a, a, a hospitality kind of culture uh, area. Um, so that allows for that. Glasgow has a, a, a metro system, the, the third oldest in the world, I think after London and Budapest. Um, this allows again uh, the movement of people uh, around the city to go to multiple cultural areas. So, you know, the, the, there is new products that have come out through innovation and uh, urban uh, design uh, and uh, sort of regeneration. In terms of the promotion, it's principally the city, uh, uh, the destination promotion agencies uh, that uh, provide this information. So it will be the, um, you know, city convention bureaus or, or destination management marketing organizations and the National Tourist Board Visit Scotland. But uh, I think the role that uh, OTAs, you know, the online travel agents like Expedia and accommodation providers have uh, through their websites, uh, hotels, accommodation providers will show all the options of being able to get from, you know, train stations, airports uh, to their location, particularly where uh, parking might be a problem due to, to, to restrictions on parking. Therefore, there is a preference for people to use uh, public transport. So we shouldn't underestimate the, 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 the tourism provider as a, a medium of being able to communicate uh, mo you know, uh, urban mobility options and also options for, for, for just traveling around and visiting the city through recommendation, which that has a very strong connection between the visitor and the destination where locals can provide you about hidden gems and how to get there possibly through, you know, quite picturesque routes. Um, just to finish, I would say the, the, the one thing that I think Scotland could do much better is through the uh, sort of shared cycling hubs. Uh, there are facilities like that, but it, it's, it's not coordinated, I think, there could be much more in the promotion of that, uh, especially as we've got these kind of urban throughways where cycling can be done safely and uh, can enhance a, a visitor's experience. Thank you, Chris. What about Barcelona? Uh, what can you tell us? How are the city and region um, trying to encourage tourists to go for more sustainable uh, mobility choices? And which policies uh, seem to be the most effective? You mentioned about the narrative. Yeah. Is it already working or is it something that you are currently working on? I think it's one of our main concerns in, uh, in the management of tourism, not only in the city of Barcelona, but in the whole region in Catalonia. Um, is uh, in, in our case, but in general, uh, mobility supposes 80% of the carbon emissions of the whole experience in tourism. And we think that is uh, our main challenge to, to face. Um, from the city of Barcelona, uh, we have a, a plan with 12 points, but the first one is related to the planning. Uh, it's true that the, in, in most of the, of the situations, the, tourist, the, the urban planning and the transportation planning uh, doesn't take into account the mm, tourism mobility. Uh, yes, in the management at the end, but not in the, uh, in the starting point that is the planning of the infrastructure. The infrastructure was planned mm, normally uh, for the use of the uh, residents, not, not thinking uh, for the use of the, of the visitors. N now in Barcelona today, for example, at 10 o'clock, in the subway probably 50% of the people using the transport, the, the, the metro, the subway in Barcelona, 
is are visitors, not residents. Now at 10 o'clock, yeah. not at night. It's, it's interesting to say that uh, the congestion hours at from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning is obviously residents because they are working to. to but after that, uh, there are uh, different uh, moments of the day where the compatibility is really good. Is uh, from 9:30 to, for example, 12 more or less. And then it's exclusively for tourism, for, for visitors. But there are some points where the coincidence mm. is, uh, the, 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 I think, the, the most intensive congestion moments in, during the day, and we need to manage it. Thanks to the tourism, we can uh, have a good dimension of the resources of the offering of public transportation in, in Barcelona, because uh, we, we can to maintain uh, a good level of uh, frequency of uh, metro, buses, and other and tramways, for example. But in some moments, the, uh, to have a good, a good dimension, for example, five in the afternoon is complicated because it's uh, the time where uh, the coincidence of both, both flows, residents and visitors, uh, are the, the, the most uh, critical point uh, in order to, to manage. It's for the reason that we, we try to prioritize uh, the uh, mobility on foot in the city of Barcelona. It's for the reason that we are working in this uh, capacity to improve the quality of the food experience, the working experience in the, in the, in the street, and it's one of the, of the priorities. But the first one is to incorporate the tourism mobility into infrastructures and service planning uh, of the different administrations and operators, not only in the city, but in the region as well, of in the met metropolitan area as well, because we need to dif have differentiation between the different groups. In, in Barcelona receives uh, every year more or less uh, 38 million of uh, visitors. 17.1 are uh, living, living uh, accommodated in Barcelona. Uh, 5.1 are visitors from uh, the metropolitan area that are going to the city for one day in order to shopping, cultural activities, and, 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 and 4.8 are coming from other tourism destinations in the littoral especially in the, in the Costa Brava or in Costa Dorada, and there are uh, 3.1 that are coming from the cruise ships. All these groups need mm. a particular approach and a particular strategy in order to manage it better. And it's important to identify when are you, for example, having a peak point of cruise in the port in order to uh, manage the dimension of the um, offering that we, you are having in the city in order to ensure a good experience in the, in the mobility in the city. Then it's uh, complicated to have a unique answer. We need to have uh, so many answers for each group, for each moment of the day, for each moment of the year. Another element that is important for us is uh, to develop a specific mobility plans for crowded places. We have different points with huge congestion of people, for example, Sagrada Familia, Gothic Quarter, uh, Camp del Barça now, now because the, they are building a new stadium, then uh, is not the, the, the icon to visit, but uh, and the Montjuic Mountain. These four points, and Parkway, these four, five points need to have a specific plan in order to manage better the, 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 the flows of tourism and right. mobility there. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Many problems. Many problems, <laughs> yes, yes. With particular hour, and I see that Bente would like to contribute. Yes, I would like to add something, because what I think is, uh, what is missing is knowledge. Uh, knowledge at the side of tourism offices, because they don't know, usually, most of them, don't know much about mobility. And a lot of mobility managers, of course not you, but all the others, don't know much about tourism. And I think it's very, very important to link these two sectors and um, to gain knowledge about the other side and to talk to each other, to start networking, mm -hmm. and um, yes, to, to know about the situation of, of the other side. Because um, you both have the, the same target groups. You, or you don't have the same target groups, you have the same aim. And um, you want to have more people on sustainable modes of transport. And you can only reach this aim if you work together. And that's what we are trying to do within a project uh, called SmarterNet. It deals with rural mobility, but it's the same topic here in urban destinations as well. If you share your, th your thoughts and work together and, um, yes, and, and start uh, to, to give knowledge to other people and uh, 
knowledge about mobility to people in tourism. The tourism staff has to know about the mobility options in your city because they talk to the people, they talk to the tourists at the information desk and they can give inspiring information. They can say, hey you, have you tried our new bus? Um, no, it's, you can do a round trip and what about um, yes, going for a walk and then take a little bike ride and then the bus back, maybe a ship also, combine different minds of transport, but they can only give this information if they know about it. So that, mm -hmm. that's my mm -hmm. point. Thank you, Bente. Nina? I would like to add shortly on it, continuing on what Bente says, it's not only important that tourism uh, officers have a knowledge and mobility, but I find it's very important that us as transport community have a knowledge about tourism. Because I have worked for 25 years in the transport community and since last year I joined tourism community and for me it's still a wonder how separate these two worlds are. So I think as a primary thing we need to understand, we speak about mobility for sustainable tourism today. There is a business travel that is a very different behavior pattern than the leisure trips, right? There are different types of tourists in terms of uh, age, I don't know, income, but also tourism interest and profiles, which we're speaking about. So I think it's very important for also transport uh, and mobility uh, community take, start seeing tourism and as an equal uh, component of mobility system. So what Patrick also mentioned that all these years of uh, planning around commute trips and residents, it's extremely important, right? It's a backbones of our cities. But with increased number of uh, tourists, we cannot overlook no more tourism mobility in urban planning. Thank you, Nina. Mm -hmm. Here, I just want to mention, uh, if we can see the Slido, um, we will have one more exchange uh, with the panelists, and then we will have a Q&A session with all of you. So uh, I already now encourage you to submit your questions to Slido, and then uh, our moderators will select them uh, for the Q&A session that is coming soon. You can already start submitting them. Um, and um, before we move on uh, to the next topic, I just wanted to ask, because I know that Chris has many more examples of uh, the different uh, successful uh, um, uh, policies implemented uh, in different places in the world for that encourage sustainable mobility uh, in tourist uh, destinations. So maybe you can share a few of them. Yeah, so <coughs> the, there's been a, a number of examples. I mentioned before about uh, urban regeneration. Uh, so within uh, the city of Glasgow uh, in Scotland, um, there's been uh, urban regeneration that have been linking communities. A lot of this has been driven by the, the local authority uh, within the city. Uh, and it is, uh, as we know, for, for most urban mobility reasons, uh, for the benefits of, of residents. Um, but this has opened up routes, and uh, we've seen uh, the regeneration of, of, of areas, uh, particularly the, the provision of hospitality within uh, former industrial complexes to, to, to encourage visitors to go. Um, low traffic areas have been a, a, a of an outcome of the, the COVID pandemic where communities have seen uh, improvements in cycle routes uh, and that has continued through. Uh, Scotland benefits from uh, an active travel um, non-governmental organization. It, it, it's a charity, it's called Sustrans. Uh, they're the ones who uh, promote uh, cycling and walking and develop uh, a national cycling uh, route, many of these uh, within cities. Um, talking to, to, to Patrick, and I'm sure he'll want to come in on this, uh, there are kind of consequences though, uh, unforeseen consequences of what seems to be uh, the idea of a low traffic zone or uh, zoned areas with uh, more active travel than, than transport, which shifts the flow of traffic to other areas and therefore is maybe moving the problem. And whilst we haven't uh, seen the, the long-term effects of things like 15-minute cities in Paris uh, or the, the, the superblock uh, concept in, in Barcelona, which is why I'll, I'll pass on to Patrick to respond to that, um, you know, the, the, the benefit of a policy uh, to, to reduce uh, personal transport options to, to encourage uh, uh, shared 
transport or active travel uh, can have a consequence of maybe shifting it to, to somewhere else. I'll, <laughs> I'll refer to, to Patrick to... Please. <laughs> yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, everything is good in the paper. Everything is good when we're planning, for example, for a more sustainable mobility in the city and to say, okay, we, we will have these uh, uh, pedestrian blocks in the, in the city, ensuring a, a, a good uh, atmosphere, uh, sharing a space between visitors and residents, and uh, everything will be, uh, would be better. But when we are applying that, uh, now it just one year ago, we started this new initiative, having five, six great blocks in the city, uh, all pedestrian areas, uh, but then the, the idea was to reduce the traffic intensi in intensity, but this traffic has been displaced to other areas. Then the difference and the uh, break between the pedestrian areas and the non-pedestrian areas are growing, and the um, kind of uh, neighborhoods and the kind of areas are changing quickly. One area is dedicated to shopping, uh, to restaurants, to bars, to nightlife, and the other is just for traffic. Uh, but it's just at uh, 50, 60 meters of difference. Then it mm. seems that there are some people that are uh, concerned because uh, the noise and the, mm, well, the, 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 the area is uh, being crowded of people and visitors. And the other, on, on the other side, the other part of citizens are not so happy because the traffic, the in intens intensity of traffic is growing and growing and growing, and the noise and the pollution and everything is uh, worse than in the past. No? Then, mm -hmm. in the past, probably everything was more homogeneous, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. so uh, sustainable, but uh, at the same level of sustainability in all parts of the city. Now there are different problems in one part and the, uh, in the other, and the congestion of traffic is uh, increasing. And uh, well, the, the mobility and the fluence of mobility in the city is worse than in the past. Then, the, then it needs a, 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 a management. Uh, a fine management of the situation in order to change everything. It's true that in one year we can take decisions and uh, take information in order to manage it better. Uh, one of the elements that um, were mentioned is we need data. We need data in order to uh, manage it. We cannot manage what we cannot measure, uh, but when we will have the global data we need, I think they could have solutions for everything. But now, at this moment, it's not so easy to say, okay, a pedestrian area is a, a peaceful uh, urban area. It's right. not so easy. Okay. <laughs> yes, you, you mentioned some of the challenges uh, of what happens mm. after implementing some uh, policies. Maybe we can discuss a little bit uh, about this before we move on. So maybe I will ask uh, to hide for the mom still for a few minutes the, the slide of questions. I encourage everybody to submit. We will move on to them in a moment. But just to focus uh, for, a la for the last round of the questions to our panelists. Um, what would you say if, if everybody moves, if all tourists move to the sustainable mobility options? Let's imagine this idealistic scenario. Let's see if it's actually idealistic. What would be the challenges then that the cities will face? Yes, uh, Chris? One, one uh, issue. Uh, I, I think it, it, it's something that will build on something that has been experienced already. Many European cities uh, suffer from over-tourism. I think it's the concentration of visitors in particular areas, uh, particular areas that have got popular visitor attractions. Um, if we have, um, say, public transport options is, is the only option for moving people around, um, you may find that visitors will be following specific routes and it, you'll get cities that will become compartmentalized. You'll have like visitor hubs of attractions and, and movement between those. Therefore, it could be put pressure on that. Um, I think if we are moving to the ideal world of uh, sort of 100% urban mobility, I think we need to be able to set up um, smaller kind of hubs that, that would distribute people around and also maybe kind of intercity kind of travel as well. So being able to move people between urban hubs using uh, public transport to try and distribute visitors, um, you know, particularly city 
based tourism, you know, the short break, people tend to stay in the, in the, in the one area and not necessarily explore just because of time. Mm. But if we can uh, sort of demonstrate uh, the ease of travel, the convenience of travel, that it's timely, that you can uh, have um, itineraries that will allow you to, 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 to sort of see a number of areas, that should distribute it and maybe reduce the pressure that's on a city. Either that or you need to, to look at limiting the number of visitors, which I know uh, many European destinations uh, are actually doing, you know, to, to sort of say, we're not going to accept everybody. There is a, a, a finite limit that, that we as a destination can, can manage. All right. Any other thoughts about this? In my opinion, the main challenge is the good balance between uh, mobility and concentration. In our case, you know, uh, Barcelona is suffering uh, uh, well, a problem that is common in other destinations in, in Europe, that is the high concentration in, in this sh short list of points. Uh, we need to distribute the tourism flows in, in, in our land, but at the same time, we want to have less mobility and less uh, carbon emissions and more facilities in order to have this uh, sustainable mobility in the land. Then it's, it's, uh, it's complicated to manage it, but we need it. Uh, tourism is mobility. We, we cannot re renounce uh, to the mobility because if not, uh, the experience of the visitors and the experience of the residents will be worse. Mm. We need to have better places to live in order to have better places to visit. And for this objective, we need to manage uh, better the capacity to distribute uh, people in our land thanks to uh, a good uh, transport public system. Mm -hmm. uh, but not only in the cities. I think it's important. We are uh, talking about urban mobility days, but it's not only urban. It's peri-urban yeah. and it's regional at the same time. Mm. In our case, we are managing the destination of Catalonia as a unique and in integral destination, a holistic destination, because if not, it will be complicated. One of our uh, projects now is uh, uh, the team mobility for tourism, that is uh, a public transportation system that could uh, offer you the option to arrive to the Barcelona airport and then go with a unique platform to the uh, Dalí Museum in Figueres or to the Tarraco Amphitheater in Tarragona or to the center of the city of Barcelona with the same application. Now, the city cars used to be uh, limited to the, uh, to the city, to the municipality. But we need to manage the whole destination with the same platform and with the same mobility system yeah. uh, for the whole destination. Okay. Uh, thank you. As, as usual, I understand with such huge uh, traffic flows um, and tourist flows in Barcelona, so many different areas of uh, activities. Um, now, a step back. Uh, what kind of challenges uh, actually tourists face uh, when trying to, thinking, oh, I, if, if possible, I want to use sustainable mobility options uh, after arrival, what kind of challenges do I face? Any thoughts about this? Yes, I, I can make it start. Um, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, they bring luggage. That's the first thing what regular commuters don't have. And uh, some of them travel with children, so there are many people and um, they don't know the city where they go to. So it's um, an area which they don't know. They don't know the, the system of the public transport. They don't know the names of the bus stops and the train stops, and they don't know the connections. And um, they, they are strangers, usually, in the city they go to, and they have to learn about it. And because of this, it's really important that the public transport association of the cities give information to the tourists that all kinds of the um, tourist mobility chain. So if you think about the bus stops, of course, you need timetables there. If you think about the buses and the trains and the metros and whatever, you need information about the lines. Um, and. Um, people should hear what's the next station, they could, should see it. It's usually, um, you, don't, you don't know it and you have to see it in different uh, technical uh, equipment, both on your smartphone, but also visible at the train and signs and on paper and all different possibilities. And um, the, 
they, they don't know about the tariff system. So as I mentioned before, is there were less people here in the room, so that's why I say it again. Uh, for me, it's very important uh, or a very good idea to have guest cards with included mobility, uh, included public transport. Like uh, there are some, uh, uh, some medium cities in Germany, like Konstanz or Münster, for example, or in Austria, Innsbruck, they have included guest cards. So every tourist who is spending at least one night there, they get a guest card with included mobility options. And, and that's, this makes it easy for people mm. to go around with pub public transport. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing which uh, was not met mentioned uh, so far is the personal attitude, which also plays a major role. So if people uh, want uh, to, to improve sustainability, and if they think that it's important uh, to, to travel ecologically sustainable, um, you can tell them, okay, what about um, using public transport? What about going by bike or taking a walk? Uh, this is good for our climate, and this is also good for the people who live here. Think about this, about the social part of sustainability, because if there's less traffic, less cars, there will be less noise in this area, and um, the people here will have less congestions, and there will be less accidents, and it's better for everybody. And you will have a better holiday as well, because uh, it's a better feeling to be here. I think that's important, too, to address the people's hearts and, and to inspire them and to give them a good feeling about it. Coming back to the narrative mm -hmm. that uh, yes. Patrick mentioned. Mm -hmm. Nina, any ideas? Yeah, I think to add to Bend, of course, mm -hmm. there's always a language barrier. There is always what Chris mentioned, the digitalization with uh, mass applications we have nowadays. Uh, each new city will have a new one. You need to install, understand. So there is all this kind of operational practical details that uh, tourists need to discover in new urban destination. And again, I would also say, like the one of the first poll we did today, right? We saw how many of us thought in daily life we use public transport, we are working shared, but today I think at least one fourth was saying we are using rented car taxis at the urban trip, right? Because it's easier, it's still much more easier. And uh, today we're in a business stream, leisure, long haul, city, a short city break. These are all very different type of tourists, type of tourism dynamics. There is one, no one solution that fits it all. And the starting point is to understand it, to really have a clear vision uh, yeah, on numbers, on socioeconomic, geographic typology, preference of tourists. Mm -hmm. before we can really answer, I think, this question in a more detail, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, just referring yeah, to yeah. the example of the taxi, yeah. uh, which most of you used on your way from the airport uh, to the center of Sevilla. And I think that's a very, very good example, yeah. because if you arrive at the airport in Sevilla, it's, uh, there is a bus. It, it costs two euro thirty <laughs> to the center. It goes all the time. It's quite easy, but there is no big sign within the airport. There should be, there, there you can see rent a car from this company and that company yeah. and that company, but the bus sign is really, really small and you have, to, you have to look for it. If you go out of the airport, where's the bus station? There should be a huge sign. Everybody should, should be able to see it at once. It should be uh, the first thing, that, the first information that you get so that it's um, normal to use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, so and I think again, when we speak about families, the cost factor will play a bigger role because then you will really wait and between taxi and bus what it costs for me. But again, with the business travel, where we know that all our costs are being covered, you very easy take a taxi because it's just a easy, smooth, and fast solution. You are not trying to think further on it. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. And what I liked was the idea, uh, coming back to the example of this conference, there's this plastic card. I don't know if everybody here has heard about it, but there's a plastic card. You can, if you have it, uh, you can use all buses here in Sevilla for free. But I'm sure that not everybody in this room has this card. Do you? Who has the card? Just, just sign up. <laughs> ah, quite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again? I would say the majority, but not all of you. Uh, it's uh -huh. great that there is this card, but um, what about um, oh, you yeah, giving <laughs> more information to the people, to the mm -hmm. participants? Just um, 
give it up. Okay. And then um, uh, we were talking about uh, transfer from the airport to the city, but one point we did not address at all is that a lot of people take the plane to the cities, and that's uh, most harmful mm. uh, to, um, to the environment, and I think we should address this as well, not only in the mobility in the city, because the first point should be to get more people to take the train uh, yes. if they go to a city. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's, just that's, a, another that's, that's the first one. <laughs> that's another discussion. Yeah. But thank you for this point, because indeed this is, this is uh, absolutely also included uh, in uh, how the emissions from tourism mm -hmm. uh, are uh, mm -hmm. calculated, so absolutely. Uh, if we can move on to the uh, questions f uh, that uh, our audience has kindly submitted. Uh, so, this is the freestyle moment. Can I pick one? <laughs> uh, first question uh, that was selected. Thank you, everybody, for submitting. Uh, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge for cities when it comes to the management of tourist mobility? I think at the moment it's really lack of data. And I think that's really where um, uh, actually also transport community can take along a tourism community with because in transport community with digital twins with all this transport modeling we have a long history of data collection we have established models but again tourism is not a component there and there is very different uh, behavior patterns there is very different parameters to to include for visitor economy mm -hmm. and i think that's where we need to cooperate together that, uh, yeah, to make sure that um, we have a good database to start uh, planning for tourism mobility. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's communication is the biggest challenge. Communi communication towards the guests, but also um, mobility and tourism towards each other. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, we talked about challenges for tourists themselves, uh, now about the mm -hmm. challenges for cities, and I'm sure that uh, many of you who represent cities and maybe work close to this area would also have other ideas. Uh, and since I see that it's possible to vote for the uh, questions, I encourage everybody to do so. I believe we will then see the, those the, who are the most voted. Uh, so for now, the most voted question is as follows how to influence stakeholders, <coughs> for example, hotels, restaurants, museums, to support sustainable mobility, since for them it doesn't matter uh, much how tourists arrive. Chris? Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 would, I would respond that um, stakeholders do matter mm -hmm. uh, uh, how their visitors arrive. Um, we do have a growing demographic of people who are conscious that their actions have a consequence. So uh, we have a generation of people coming through that want to travel, uh, but realize that air travel has uh, an impact on the environment. So how do they rationalize that? Um, I would say that many tourism stakeholders um, are conscious that they want to promote uh, active and uh, sort of uh, mobility options to be able to get to their destinations so that they can uh, connect with that particular demographic. Um, so I think that there is a, a, a consumer trend towards uh, more sustainable forms of transport, particularly to get to, to those places. Secondly, and, and referring back to, to Scotland, there is a, a national tourism strategy, and part of that national tourism strategy is that tourism should be delivered in a, a responsible manner. Uh, that's both uh, environmental and, and social, uh, thinking about communities that, that tourism uh, occurs in. So stakeholders, if they are to realize the aims and objectives of the, the, the tourism strategy need to be aware of uh, the, the various options that minimize um, you know, uh, carbon emissions, uh, the use of personal transport to, to promote those. And, and I think as we mentioned before, many uh, tourism providers, particularly accommodation providers, uh, they, they do have multiple options of how to get from uh, transport hubs like airports, railway stations, to their properties. 
in, in a sustainable way. Um, what we haven't touched on, I think, is the supply side of these things. And I think the role that uh, kind of e-cargo bikes would have in the distribution of uh, supplies to, to uh, particularly urban-based tourism stakeholders, um, looking maybe at kind of the self-catering sector, you know, like the kind of the apartment uh, ones, uh, the ability to be able to get so like, you know, food, other products uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, is something that can uh, happen and there are some kind of quite innovative uh, products that are coming out. Uh, one being, um, uh, 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 it came out of the, the Glasgow, the UCI World Cycling Championships. Uh, a group of cyclists uh, in the city got together with uh, various coffee shops. Uh, it's called Grounds to Go. Uh, and what they do is they cycle around with these e-cargo bikes collecting used coffee grounds and collecting those to, to provide compost for uh, the botanic gardens. So, you know, you've got this kind of uh, virtuous kind of circular economy of, of recycling uh, and engagement with, with visitors so that they can have an active choice as to where they go for, for coffee that's going to actually have some good. Thank you, yeah. Chris. Be before, before I give you the, the floor, I just want to say that usually stakeholders are... Um, uh, driven by income, by money. So if if they can uh, be encouraged by the city, mm -hmm. uh, for example, I don't know, in a hotel to have also a bike rental, uh, it, this is also a little, but still still a revenue, and this uh, can Im influence their image as uh, sustainable green, which starts to become being cool. Mm -hmm. Nina? Yes, first I want to agree that there is raising awareness within the tourism sector and that we need to take care uh, of sustainable tourism mobility, so we start to care, right? And I also want to add that for me the word influence here is a little bit disturbing because it's again about cooperation. So how many of you are talking to destination marketing organizations? How many of you are talking to tour operators, to travel agents, to travel media who are really shaping all these narratives, who have tremendous influence on how tourism arrive and how they move inside of the cities. So I think personally for me this is really about not influencing but really taking on board tourism stakeholders who have an influence on sustainable mobility lack, urban, peri-urban, rural uh, planning to take them along in the decision-making process in the city and start talking to them because they really have an influence on uh, this. For example, the tour operators, right? They're really shaping where we are going, how we are going. So why we are very often offering fly car rental packages? Why basically by offering a uh, fly, which is, I fully agree with you, it's really a topic which needs to be taken serious consideration, uh, but we are promoting directly two most polluting transport modes. Aviation sector is not directly offering you public transport ticket and the whole planning for your, I don't know, visit. They offer car rental option. Yes. So I think these are stakeholders which need to be taken seriously into the dialogue and we need to solve it together. Do you suggest that uh, then uh, aviation companies should pair a partner with cities uh, in order to start promoting? No, well, that's not transport. what I'm suggesting at all because also that's a bit of a tricky question because by doing it, you're actually facilitating flying. And that's also not what we want in tourism, right? Mm. Because it's the most polluting mode which can exist for the tourism next to cruise shipping. So that's a little bit of a, maybe indeed a question for another discussion, you know? Definitely. <laughs> so I think Vente also wants to add. Yes, I uh, think uh, if uh, you manage uh, to tell the stakeholders that they will improve their marketing situation, their position will be better if they include sustainable mobility options and if they tell their tourists to use them. Because there are more and more people who, um, who don't have a car, who don't own a car, who don't have a driving license, especially in other big cities. And these people want to go on holiday as well. And if they look for a destination, they will take the city um, which offers the best um, alternative um, mobility options. So, and if you are the accommodation or the hotel, 
which includes uh, some special offers for tourists who arrive by train. Maybe you have a reduced fare or you get a welcome drink for those people or whatever. Um, you will get these people because um, they either they don't have a car or they don't want to use it and uh, it, it's easier for them. And so I think that the, the market position is uh, one point and the other point is that it's just necessary. Just tell them about the, um, the, the tourist, uh, tourism organizations uh, want to take care of uh, sustainability and they have yeah. big targets and a big vision. And what about joining and coming together and uh, working on a joint vision on sustainable mobility? And then it's part of it is uh, the arrival and the mobility on site. Mm. And right. well, I, I think it, it does matter Mm. For, uh, for all of them, um, both at a global perspective uh, and on a, as a local perspective, because there will be less traffic directly in front of their door. Mm. And that's, that's right. an improvement as itself. Thank you, Bente. Uh, as you can thank you to anybody who um, uh, asked this question. Clearly, it moved our panelists a lot. <laughs> uh, now, uh, moving on to the question that moved uh, nine of you. Um, there was a question by Fred about um, the sustainable tourist mobility plans. And here I just want to say uh, that this should be asked in the context of the sustainable urban mobility plans, uh, which should be put in place by all the main urban nodes following the TNT network. So a uh, question to our panelists. Do you know examples of existing sustainable tourist mobility plans? Uh, and also, how do they relate to the existing or potential sustainable urban mobility plans? Should there be two? Should they be uh, one? What is your opinion and experience? In from now, from the point of view of Next Tour, the European Network of Regions for a Competitive Sustainable Tourism, we, ha we have different examples of sustainable tourism mobility plans in different areas, different regions, and different cities mm -hmm. in, in Europe. I think it's uh, important to say that Paris in the France is developing a really good project in order to, well, to improve the mobility of the city uh, thanks to the global mobility plan, including tourism. It's not just to talk about tourism mobility plans. I think uh, the mobility must be managed in a holistic way and uh, they need uh, to have the global vision about the, 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 the situation. In this case, in Paris de France, I think it's a good practice. Another one is uh, in, in Flanders, for example, where they are uh, developing uh, not urban, but interurban mobility pla pla uh, plans. It's important to say that in different destinations, it's important to manage good uh, solutions from uh, Bruges to Antwerp to Gan, for example, and to uh, integrate the urban and the interurban mobility strategy, because uh, is uh, the, 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 the solution for this network of uh, art cities in, in, in Flanders. In the case of Barcelona, we have a, a sustainable tourism mobility plan with these 12 points, uh, focusing in the different problems we have in the, in the city with these congestion points. I think everyone is moving uh, for a more sustainable mobility strategy. And uh, the main thing that we are reflecting, reflecting in next tour is the governance of the situation and the global governance of the destination, not only uh, for tourism, but for everyone. In this uh, uh, strategy, we need, to, uh, have the, have, we need to assure that all the agents involved in the, in the uh, value chain of the experience could be involved in the plan. It's for this reason that in Catalonia we have approved now the uh, national commitment for, for responsible tourism, including the signature of residents, neighbors, even the neighbors of the most concentrated and overcrowded areas in the city, yeah. signing the, the same agreement, trade unions, uh, association of, of companies, uh, the sector, the uh, public administration, then more than 200 main agents related with the tourism experiences signing the same document, identifying the model of tourism we want and the mobility model we want. I think is the key factor mm -hmm. to ensure the success of the actions. If not, uh, the plans could be, well, just another paper. Mm -hmm. But if you have the commitment of these agents, for example, the hoteliers uh, will be involved in the solution, even if, it's, if it doesn't matter, doesn't matter for the 
local activity of this hotel, they will be involved in the global solution because it's good for destination, it's good for residents, and will be good for visitors, and obviously for the uh, result of the, of the company. So I imagine they not only sign something that you have prepared for them, but it followed like a deep Absolutely. dialogue uh, process, Absolutely. no? Mm -hmm. When you are starting uh, the uh, consultation process, we need to follow it uh, because if not, it's not uh, mm -hmm. true. All right, great to hear that example. Any other examples of existing sustainable tourist mobility plans? Uh, in my, my experience, um, uh, most mobility plans are obviously destination-based. They're, they're not specifically uh, for, for tourists. I think the, the question should be that um, the tourism sector should be considered as part of those destination plans. Uh, generally, you're talking about different departments, so a city promotional agency might not have the connections with the transportation agencies, uh, possibly within the same broader local authority, uh, uh, you know, local government uh, structure. Um, so I think there, there needs to be that realization that um, a destination or an urban mobility plan needs to consider visitors and that's where the tourism sector should have their plan that can be brought in. So an understanding of who their visitors are, what their visitors do, what they would like their visitors to be in the future. So what behaviours do you want to influence in terms of reaching, you know, broader policy issues of um, decarbonisation, removal of uh, personal transport from city centres, mm -hmm. uh, distribution of visitors, things like that. So I think it, it, it's forming those connections. So it's not necessarily having a separate plan, mm -hmm. but it's having the tourist objectives as part of uh, the, the broader uh, city destination plan. Thanks for this voice. Uh, considering the time, we have seven minutes left, so I will move on to the next uh, question. Uh, and I think it will be the last one before a short summary, unless the answers will be very short. Let's see. Um, I would like to connect the two questions. Uh, one about the tools uh, that can be used for promoting sustainable tourism, and we have already mentioned some of them, like visit cards. But uh, maybe, you know, examples of gamification techniques, uh, information apps, and that links very well to the uh, question visible in the bottom of the screen. So uh, how can we use digitalization and data uh, to help making tourism more sustainable? So the more examples, the better, uh, if you can share with our audience. Okay, well, uh, additional to those uh, examples which have been mentioned in the question already, I would like to name uh, social media influencers uh, and well-known persons who uh, lead by example, who visit a city, like uh, whatever, uh, some kind of stars, football stars or whatever, uh, they are going to the city and of course they are using public transport. Uh, as I said, uh, visit cards or guest cards are very helpful, I think, gamification, of course. And, um, and I think uh, that, uh, y yes, you, uh, it's, it's important that you, um, that, that you, um, you work together with the tourism office because they are marketing professionals mm. and um, they have the knowledge about promotion of this. And if you include these people from the beginning, yep. like whatever mobility project you have, mm -hmm. just include, talk to the tourism people and on the other side, that tourism people, whatever tourism project, if they start a new hotel, of course they should talk to mobility people <laughs> so that, it's, uh, so that it's, uh, there is uh, a bus stop, a train station and the name uh, so that uh, people can uh, react and they can, uh, uh, that this is visible for the people. Mm -hmm. So public transport should be visible for all mm -hmm. tourists all the time. Nina? Yeah, I can add maybe less on the concrete uh, tools, but also another actor we shouldn't forget in this conversation is really booking platforms. Mm -hmm. So the way that people are booking their holidays, their trips, right, business travel agencies, in the way that uh, we also see more and more that uh, people are doing, uh, are booking holidays themselves via the platforms, right? 
So what we see on this platform when we come, again. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is also, yeah, like connects closely to the social media digitalization, right? So the way, like, consumer behavior and the way uh, consumers are approaching all this is changing very fast due to all these technologies. And indeed, um, yeah, maybe there's actually potential for these tools to, to think about how we can nudge consumers to more sustainable tourism mobility choices at destination at the stage of the booking already. That we have a bonus, not of the car rentals again, but public transport ticket, right? As soon as you, I don't know, Google to go to Barcelona directly, uh, I don't know, AI or whatever, <laughs> most modern uh, hype in uh, IT, directly propose us uh, public transport uh, schemes and tickets and options uh, to book together. Mm -hmm. So I think there is indeed all the potential behind of it, and we need to think of uh, different uh, mm -hmm. sides. But the, there are some very good examples of uh, digital solutions mm -hmm. uh, for the distribution of visitors around urban um, centers, uh, self-guided walks uh, through apps. Uh, you can have uh, augmented reality uh, as well, so that you go on particular routes, and when you get to destinations, it can provide you with information on those. Um, some of those are, are in existence. I'm, I'm sure people are aware of them. Uh, I can certainly recommend uh, some uh, examples of that, but for time, I'll hold there. But um, you know, that gamification, I think, does attract a certain audience. What I would say is it comes down to uh, search engine optimization. So, you know, destinations, uh, destination management organizations will pay to have apps produced, but they just won't get the rankings on searches for, people, for visitors to find them. So it's all down to familiarity. If you know about destination, the plastic travel card, you know, some people knew about it, others didn't. Um, you know, how do you find out about that, that, that kind of thing? So uh, when Google is, you know, probably the, the most used transport organization tool for visitors to new destinations in terms of being able to work out how to use multiple modes of transport from a particular point, you know, that is really the starting point. After that, it's about getting the right app that is going to be high enough on the rankings that visitors will be able to see it, download it, and apply it. Thank you for that. Yes? I think it's uh, technology is a solution uh, because uh, the visit cards and the digital uh, solutions could be uh, part of the answer of this question. But let me say what, in my opinion, is not the solution, it is it's dangerous, mm -hmm. is uh, to have um, financial incentives to uh, the sustainable tourism for visitors. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, for example, the, the example of Japan Rail Pass, mm -hmm. uh, com comparing with other solutions in Europe, the Japan Rail Pass suppose a first that are um, in 60-70% uh, we uh, come with subsidies from the public finances. Mm -hmm. Then the resident could identify that, uh, that as a, well, as a, as a, as a um, not so balanced relationship with visitors and residents. I think it's important that residents need to feel uh, in the same level of uh, situations than, for example, the visitors. Because if residents receive worse conditions than visitors, we uh, will have problems. We need to balance absolutely the, the, the needs of the visitors with the needs of, of the residents. And solutions that could uh, finance uh, with the subsidies, uh, the mm, uh, sustainable uh, mobility for tourism, but not for residents, could be at the end uh, a risk for the good uh, well, uh, coexistence from both collectives. Mm -hmm. Um, we are out of time, so I, will, I would like to thank all the panelists for uh, your thoughtful answers and uh, thank you to all of you uh, for all the questions and your attention. I know that many of you uh, would be perfectly able to participate in the discussion as well, so I may only encourage you to continue the conversation with our panelists during the coffee break and the lunch break. I will also be happy to continue the conversation myself. And since uh, I work in the European Commission and there was a question about what the EU can do, <laughs> that could be, uh, of course, another discussion. But I just want to say that for sure, one of uh, the things that we do is to provide money. 
And in one sentence, in many regions within the cohesion policy funds, uh, there are um, available um, funding sources for uh, relevant investments in infrastructure, but also in, uh, in uh, soft projects. And also uh, for those uh, cities that are in the urban nodes, uh, the Connecting Europe facility projects uh, can be absolutely relevant. So I encourage you to check those possibilities in the cities that are closest uh, to your heart and uh, location. Uh, I hope you got um, useful and um, inspirational insights uh, during today's session. Um, I encourage you to continue the discussion among yourselves and with the panelists, and I wish you the, uh, a good rest of the conference. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you.